didn't mean to turn it off there. Okay, so as you can see, this is a, if you've watched the previous radio, you can now see a faceplate. Um, this is a T-Berry Ranger T. It's a very rare AM sideband radio um, made in late 1977 to 78, going by the date codes on some of the semiconductors in it. Um, now, this radio is actually not the one you saw in the first video. Uh, that would be this one. Yes, there are two of them here for repair work and restoration. Uh, extremely rare radio to start with, even rarer to see two of them in the same picture on the same bench. Um, but in any case, this one had basically uh, more or less a lot of the same problem. Now, this one did have some reception and some transmit, but it was absolutely horrible. I mean, I can't overstate how, how the reception was so crackly and the transmit low. It just, anything that could be wrong was wrong. Well, just replacing the electrolytic capacitors in this and doing some circuit trace repairs again, because this one had the same problem, leaky capacitors, and I'll get, get to that in a minute. But uh, basically the same problems. This one is now back functioning and would appear to be working just fine. So you can hear it had reception. Uh, it does have some segments because this is actually not channel. That's not right. You can see there's a segment out. See, see there's channel three, the line's missing. So that's actually supposed to was on channel six is what we're on there. But uh, yeah, so that'll be no, no, no biggie to fix. It's either a bad resistor or the LED's bad itself. It's not the channel selector. It's that because it never, usually if it's a bad contact in a channel selector, you'll see it flash in and out occasionally, and it's it's just out all the time. So it's it's just plain bad. Um, so I'll get that fixed. But other than that, the radio's working great. Um, one thing that's, I don't want to say it's unheard of, but extremely rare. Now, I have not touched basically anything other than replacing all the electrolytic capacitors, um, yeah, I had this heat sink out so I could get to the ones down in there where the problems were. Now you can see you know, how tucked down in there there's electrolytic capacitors that leaked. And the same ones leaked in this one, too, along with a bunch of others, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, you look at all of the transformer tuning cores. They're all still sealed in factory wax. Now, I reseal them when I work on them, but I have not. You can tell this is still factory. This is original. Every single one has, is untouched. So I have not done any alignment whatsoever on this. This is basically how it was received. New electrolytic capacitors fix some traces and corrosion and whatnot. And I want you to look at the frequency counter right there. And like I say, we're on channel 19, which is 27.185. And look at that, 27.185016. It's within 16 hertz of being dead dead nuts on frequency. And it just flipped down one hertz. I mean, so within 15 hertz of being perfect, which on AM you'd never notice. And actually that's within specs because most of the specifications when you're doing the alignment on the frequencies inside are within plus or minus 20 hertz. So actually that's within within uh, range. Um, I haven't checked sideband yet, but... Uh, you know, it works, so transmit, it's hooked up and we're on in dummy load, so on AM, got about a 5 watt dead key. Let me turn my mic gain up here. And the mic gain's not, I'm not talking about mic gain on the radio, it doesn't doesn't have a, a mic gain as you can see. The mic gain on my power mic here, I'd turn that down. So, audio, radio, one, two, one, two, audio. You can see about maybe 14 watts. And flip the sideband. Audio. Audio. One, two. Audio. Check. One, two. Audio. About 18. Audio. Audio. One, two. One, two. One, two. Uh, radio. Check. Sideband. So, radio is pretty much just electrolytic capacitors. Like I said, I can't overstate <laughs> with old radios how important that is. And this radio was... I don't want to say uh, catastrophic because it didn't harm anything, but here, now, I've already recapped both of them, so actually there's the caps for the, for the first one, and here's, these are all the capacitors out of this one. 
So, and I'm not talking about just ESR, you know, the resi you know, internal resistance measurement. I'm talking, when I say leaking, I mean they've actually leaked external and they're corroding. So, if you look at almost all of these I have from about here forward, every single one of them, actually that light's almost a little bit too much. Yeah, that might be better, you can see. But if you can see all the terminals, how they're green. Like I say, all these ones in the front have leaked to some point. Come on, get this to focus a little bit better. But you can see all that corrosion on all of those terminals, and of course that leaked down through onto the board and all over the place. So I had a lot of cleanup. This one was, I wanted to say a lot worse, but it was a little bit worse than the other one. It had maybe, the other radio had about three quarters as many leaky capacitors. But uh, like I say, all of that, that, and that's a nightmare, trying to clean all that goop off, the corrosion off, and then some of the traces actually had one trace on the underside. I had to cut out a section. It had corroded, get soaked through the board, through, you know, basically right past through the pins down to the underside, leaked around the solder trace and then corroded out a big section of the board. So I had to actually do a repair there, like I had said in the previous one, with some copper foil. But uh, that's why you want to change these things because they're going to go bad and obvious. And I honestly, I don't think I've ever seen uh, that many leaking capacitors in one radio. I mean, I'll have to turn a light on it blind the camera, but I want to count here. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, 14 of the capacitors were leaking externally. Leaking their dielectric out onto the PCB, and then the rest of them. And then also, you'll see, uh, there's these are actually electrolytic capacitors also, but they're not aluminum electrolytic. They're tantalum and They've been replaced down in here. That's these two little orange guys right here. They were replaced. And when I do an electrolytic capacitor change, I always replace tantalum capacitors. Uh, unlike an aluminum electrolytic like these, they still work. You know, this radio is a good example. It still worked. It had receive and transmit. It was horrible, but it did work. So these capacitors, as they were going bad, slowly start to short out inside. Just, you know, over time, more and more and more and more, they start to short out. So your, you know, performance problems, receive, transmit, you know, stability, everything just goes out the window, but it happens usually gradually over time. These little guys here, they don't do that. When a tantalum goes bad, they usually just blow up. We're not talking a violent explosion. They'll crack in half, but it'll pop. But they fail. They have... Unlike these, like I say, these can go open. I've seen them go open before. If one of the terminal leads on the inside where it attaches to the foil corrodes off, it'll go open. Or they start to short out, but usually by the time these start to short out that bad, your performance is down so far, you're going to have to be sending it to somebody to repair it, you know, to repair it anyhow. These things give you no warning. When a tantalum capacitor goes bad, and like I say, they basically have one failure mode, and that is a dead short. So you turn the radio on, it's working fine, and all of a sudden you hear pop, just a little pop or a crack. And you might hear something rattling around inside, because like I say, they usually tend to blow off one side. But they they go bad in a dead short, and that's why they, they crack or blow up. So I always change those. You know, it's cheap insurance. I mean, it's only it's only two capacitors in this radio. Some radios, you know, Cobra 2000 GTLs and some of the other ones, you'll have a handful more than that. But it's rare you'll see probably the most I've seen in, let's say, a CB radio is maybe, maybe 10 uh, tantalum capacitors. You know, they're more expensive than aluminum electrolytics. But like I say, it's cheap insurance. Because one of these things goes bad, it's, it is going to fail in a dead short. And depending where it's at, it might cause a serious problem. In this radio, they're right off of the PLL chip, which is back up under here. Okay? So you don't want to be having to track down a rather rare PLL chip. So, like I say, I just wanted to show this one how just simply replacing the electrolytic capacitors in this radio has basically brought it back to life. Um, you know, all the nightmarish received... I mean, it was... God, it sounded like a blender 
you know, very low sensitivity and the static noise was, oh, it was through the roof. Um, output power was low, modulation was really low, and a lot of the low modulation would have been caused by some of these larger uh, aluminum electrolytics in the audio circuit. Um, we're starting to go bad, but uh, so I got to get this one finished up and do the alignment. Now, I can't find and I don't know of uh, an alignment procedure on these, um, but I do have the schematic for it. Uh, so basically I'm going to have to wing it with a schematic, go through, check the mixing frequencies for the, you know, the crystals to figure out what I need to set the os all the oscillator adjustments at, and, uh, you know, again, go through the schematic and figure out which are uh, you know, the receive cores, you know, the transformers for ad adjustment, and which are for transmit. Transmit should be fairly straightforward. Those will usually be all these back here in the back, especially your large open frame ones like this. And one interesting thing about this radio, uh, before I forget to mention it, they 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 went, did a few extra steps on this. I found I found interesting. Um, now all of these cans, okay, these are these act as a shield for the transformer inside the adjustable transformer, and they're grounded. There's a you know terminal on each side. If you can see that little hole right there beside the can, that's where a leg off of this can goes down through, and it's soldered to the ground plane on the underside of the board. So all these cans are grounded, but I guess just to be extra safe and like I said I think it's a really good idea see how they have the solid wire tie all these cans together can from here over to the the crystal filter you know they have them all tied together and I, and they hit mainly in the, the back section here they're not they didn't do that in the front they did that in the back um, I believe their reasoning behind doing that is here's your driver and final transistor so there's a lot of RF energy back here and to just be extra sure that these cans were very well grounded to the ground plane of the radio, they ran these extra wires. Because like I say, there's a lot of RF energy here, so for fear maybe something bleeding back in through these cans, if they weren't properly grounded, they just went that extra step. But that's something you just don't see nowadays. You know, nowadays, manufacturers, no offense to them, but... The, the, that, that wire costs too much money for them to do. You know, I don't want to say they're lazy. It's just radios are built with nothing but profit in mind. Um, so, uh, you know, you can't overstate how much better built radios were like this. I mean, real copper. This isn't copper plated. i got to put these these plates back in. These are the ground shields for the under, you know, on the underside of the circuit board. Too. I had to remove these to get in and uh, change the capacitors, and I want to pull these boards off because they're falling off. If they haven't fallen off already, I'm going to pull them off and re-glue them back on. But these are solid copper. You know, you don't see solid copper in CB radios anymore nowadays. Actually, even back then, you didn't see a lot of solid copper. So, you know, again, extra expense. A solid sheet of, you know, copper, same thing there. There's two, you know, two of these on each. There's these two shields on the underside. You've got this there. You know, they could have done things differently, you know, to simplify it, but they didn't. You know, relays cost a lot of money, big mechanical device. This has two of them. Now, granted, that does, <laughs> on the downside, makes it, makes makes for a noisy switching circuit. But, uh, you know, lots of big capacitors in here, has, you know, lots of, Fil filtering, you know, built-in storage, because basically an electrolytic capacitor, in most cases in a CB radio, think of it as a short-term battery. That's what it is, and that's also how it filters. If there's a spike or a dip in voltage and whatnot, the capacitor can help to make up for that. But uh, like I say, lots of big capacitors in here. High now, these are actually bigger than what was in here. The originals, I usually always upright the, a lot of the larger capacitors uh, when I replace them. So this one was a 2200 16 volt. And you can see this one's now 3300. Actually, both of these are both 3300 and they're 50 volt rated. I don't like using, like there's some of these small ones down here, 10 volt. I don't like using 10, 16, and even 25 volt caps in these in radios like this. You're getting, especially with the 16 volts, 
you're getting too close to your line voltage, you know, to the 13.8, and especially in a you know, in a vehicle, depending what their charging system's putting out, it could be putting out damn near 16 or, you know, spiking well over 16. That's really really hard. That's, you know, next to heat. The next deadliest thing there is for an electrolytic capacitor is over voltage. Well, if it's a 16 volt cap, you know, you're already at 13.8 and you might be getting spikes well over 16 in an automotive application, so it just be safe. Well, like I say, I always increase the value also, but uh, I always increase the the voltage rating. So all of these capacitors in this radio now have been changed over to 50 volt, and there's actually even some 100 volts in here. Now, it did not need 100 volts. That just happens to be... For the size, I don't really need to go any lower in voltage, and that cuts down on some of my inventory if I keep hundreds. Um, I don't have to keep the 50s. Now, I will keep some of the smaller voltage values for specific applications, usually not in CBs. That would be in ham radios and some other stuff. But uh, like I say, most of the cases in a radio like this, all the capacitors have been switched over to 50 volt. So it helps to increase their life, because like I say, that's the one thing that's really hard on an electrolytic capacitor is running running close to you know the red line or over what their rated voltage is so i'll get the uh alignment done on this one get the other one up on the bench get it uh repaired like i say i gotta looks like i gotta change the display segment on this one i haven't even taken it apart yet i'm not sure if it's a, a one piece or a two piece display but uh we'll get that fixed up uh, if you see some scotch tape here this one had this this is actually a it's gold colored but it's an aluminum trim piece. The glue just over the decades it had dried out and it was falling off. So it's glued on tapes there just to hold it until the, the glue's dry. So that's actually probably dry by now because I, I did that before I started the recap job. So I'll get that taken off. But uh, you can see she's coming back to life. So look for a guess, I guess what will be a part three on these.